you have me in the back. Larry? Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, this is great. Thank you very much to all of you for coming here tonight. Another basically a capacity <coughs> crowd for the second uh, in our 2017 Michael Crowley Lecture Series. Uh, and tonight, uh, first of all, every time I get up here, someone says, introduce yourself. I, I look at it as I've seen so many faces so many times, but uh, there are always someone new. Uh, I am Mike Slain. I lead the Museum of Newport Irish History team, a very uh, capable and talented uh, board of directors that bring you these venues. And, and you'll hear from one of them tonight, uh, Dr. John Quinn. Uh, so it's great to have you here. Uh, I just want to mention also, next month, November 13th, is the next lecture. And the reason I mention that now is uh, so that people will sign up early. We had to, uh, unfortunately, tell a lot of people for this lecture that uh, they were on the wait list. We were able to move up some of them. November 13th, uh, Ray McKenna will be here to discuss uh, the Irish in Providence. Uh, and tonight, what I'd like to do also is mention, and I didn't see some of the, the we have a couple of uh, very special guests here tonight. We have Father Owen Moran from Limerick, County Limerick, Ireland. And <laughs> Dr. Scott Malloy, who uh, introduced the last lecture. Yeah. Always, <laughs> he's always a... Uh, Always great, comes and educates us and entertains. Entertains. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. And we have the Durnans with us from Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Are they here? Okay. Richard and Caroline. Yeah, they're, they're members uh, of the Museum of Newport Irish History, but they live in Seattle and they made it here. They came all the way to see Dr. Quinn tonight. <laughs> That's great to have you with us. <laughs> Administrative announcements. Remember, there's only two really. Restrooms in the back, women's room in the front here. And in case of fire, run this way. Okay, really, I mean that. Don't get, unless, of course, there's smoke coming out of there. <laughs> I mean that you get 150 people out of here. You want to leave this way to the front and out to the right there. Uh, if you go that way, you're going to end up going all the way through uh, the International Tennis Hall of Fame. So it's my pleasure tonight uh, to introduce one of our board members, uh, Dr. John Quinn, uh, who you recall was with us last April. Uh, he was that one of three on a panel with Dean Robinson and uh, Dr. Don Degnan, mm -hmm. who talked to us on the, uh, the April 16th uh, Easter Rise. And as I mentioned, he's on our board. He is very widely published. He has an abiding interest in Catholicism and the Catholic influence on the Irish and other ethnic groups. He graduated Georgetown. He's a double domer from Notre Dame. Got his, got his uh, master's degree and his doctorate in history from Notre Dame. He's been with Sally Regina for 20 years now. 25 years. Well, that's great. And it's just such a, a privilege to have him with us here tonight. Dr. John Quinn. Too. I don't know, maybe all high school kids are tech whizzes, but 
he just started looking at my PowerPoint and saying, well, why don't you do this and this and this? Like, hey, take it over. So that was good. Um, I'm on a sabbatical this semester, um, and initially I, I was trying to tell all my colleagues about my project, and, uh, and then I'm you know, hard at work doing research and writing and just working in a little different way than they are. And, they don't believe the No. So uh, a couple weeks ago I was talking to the chaplain at Salve, Father Saji, and I was explaining to him in detail about my project about Catholics in Newport. And after I finished, he, you know, he listened carefully and he said, that sounds great, Dr. Quinn. Enjoy your vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so now when people ask me, what are you doing this semester? I say, well, I'm working on my backhand. I'm trying to work on my overhead a bit. So hey, good for you. Um, well, um, this project, I started working on Catholics in Newport, oh gosh, eight or nine years ago. And my thought on the colonial period was that A, Catholics were a negligible presence. They may not even have been here at all, or if they were here, they were here in very small numbers. Um, in fact, the Catholics weren't numerous really anywhere in the colonies, except one colony. Did people know what? Uh, Maryland. Maryland. Yeah, good. Uh, and then a few in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so my thought was uh, Rhode Islanders wouldn't have thought twice about Catholics. They just wouldn't have been on their radar screen. That's what I was thinking. Um, and, but my second thought was, well, if there had been any Catholics here, they would have been accepted um, because of this, because of John Clark's charter of 1663, right? John Clark, a new porter. And I really like this. I don't know if you see in the original text here, uh, but let's see, there's King Charles. He's the one who signs it. So that says Charles II by the grace of God. Anyway, then I can't, can't read much past that. But um, buried in there is the line that everyone is pro provided full liberty in all religious concernments. So a very broad toleration was promised, really unusual. And so I, that was my thought that, you know, if there probably weren't any Catholics here. Maybe if there were a few, they would have been covered under John Clark's uh, charter here. And I thought that was a reasonable. Um, conclusion. Um, so, but then I think about two years ago, I came across this book called No King, No Popery, Anti-Catholicism in Colonial New England. And I thought, I better pick that up. <laughs> this book, like, um, the author's name was Francis Cagliano, and he goes into considerable detail about how New Englanders were fixated on Catholics. I mean, that's sort of the term I think he would use, almost obsessed with Catholics, and that they love to stage anti-Catholic rituals. So I was surprised by all of this. But then as I was reading more closely, I realized um, he keeps talking about Boston. And Boston, well, you know, I think it's fair to say Boston was not the most welcoming place in the colonial age. If you've been to Boston, have people seen this statue? Do you know this is by the State House? I don't know if you can see it. It's of a lady named Mary Dyer. Does anybody know what? Happened to Mary Dyer? Yeah, not so good. And do you know what she did? No. She was found guilty of being a Quaker. So, and they had warned her. They said, if you come back, we're going to have to hang you. And she came back. Um, so anyway, Boston was a tough place. And so as I'm reading about all these rituals in Boston, I figured, well, that makes sense, really, that Boston would be as harsh towards Catholics as they were towards Quakers. Boston, you had to be a Puritan. And if you weren't a Puritan, you were in some danger. Um, but so I kept reading the book anyway. And as I'm reading about these ceremonies in Boston, I noticed a footnote saying, popular in Newport as well. And then I thought, oh, <laughs> no, that's not what I was expecting. So, um, so reading his book and then, then the research I've done since then has made me kind of rethink my, my original ideas about this. And uh, now I think I would say Newport was a very tolerant place towards a very wide variety of Protestants, uh, you know, unusually tolerant in that respect, right? And Newport's going to have Quakers, Anglicans, Congregationalists, Baptists, more Baptists, Seventh-day Baptists, Moravian Brethren, I'm not quite sure what they were, but, uh, and then what's most striking still, of course, about Newport is who else is here? Jewish people. And, um, I got a chance to go into the Jewish cemetery. I don't know if people have, if anyone's had a chance to do that. It's only open one day a year, and in August, it's a Sunday in August, and I happened to see a notice, and we went in, and 
very interesting. There, there are uh, stones from 1677. So almost 100 years before Turo Synagogue, we're always talking about how old Turo is. But you have a Jewish community that goes way, way back even before Turo. And so, so in a lot of ways, Newport really was a remarkably tolerant place, but they drew the line at Catholics, which is very interesting, right? That the Jewish people would be tolerated and Catholics not. I mean, it just, it's, it's not what you might think. Um, well, the argument that I've come up with now is, I think colonists' attitudes towards Catholics were shaped by three wars, all of which pitted Protestant England versus Catholic France. England and France battling it out, and there's going to be fallout from those wars for Catholics. Um, the first two conflicts are going to lead to a backlash against Catholics in the colonies, and the third is going to create this incredible groundswell of goodwill towards Catholics, especially in Newport. Um, you probably know what some of these wars are, I'll bet. Uh, and so I'm going to argue, uh, oh, my title's not here anymore, but that the good feelings that the French are going to help to engender, that's going to spill over for years and years and going to help pave the way for the Irish who come later to build that little old fort in the harbor. <laughs> and so, um, well, I want to start with the earliest conflicts and just show the fallout from them. The first was, uh, occurs in 1688 when the King of England, James II, was overthrown by his own son-in-law, William of Orange, who was married to his daughter Mary. Um, so a real family feud here, right? So we've got, uh, I love these guys' hair. It's really kind of impressive. I think that must have taken a long time to get them all washed that way. But, um, so, uh, well, Parliament's leaders had invited William to come over from Holland. Uh, he and Mary were living in Holland uh, because they said James had adopted absolutist policies and was ignoring them, ignoring Parliament. Um, Parliament was also concerned that James had converted to Roman Catholicism. And his story is a little uh, complicated. He was born an Anglican. Uh, around the age of 40, he converted to Catholicism. His mother had been a Catholic, so I think that was all kind of in the air for him. His father was a Protestant and his mother was Catholic. Um, so he marries, and he's an Anglican at the time of his first marriage, and they have two children, so two daughters, Mary and Anne. So here's Mary, the eldest child. Uh, so they were raised Anglican. I, I should probably have a whole diagram here and draw a little kind of arrows. Uh, and so then his wife dies, uh, he converts to Catholicism, marries a second time, marries an Italian princess named Mary. Um, and uh, so now he takes the throne as a Catholic king of England in 1685, but the heir to the throne is his Protestant daughter. So it's all very complex family dynamics. Um, takes the throne in 1685, uh, and he's in his early 50s, and so I think Parliament just thought, well, you know, okay, uh, he'll be in for a while, but then his daughter will take over. Well, in 1688, James's wife gave birth to a healthy baby boy named James, who they promptly baptized in a Roman Catholic ceremony. Um, now, how does the succession to the English throne work? Who's now first in line? Is it the oldest child? No. Okay, no. so the boy takes precedence over the girls, right? And, right if, it used to be. Well, and that's now changed, right? Okay, so, so at least at this time, the males took precedence, right? So that little baby is now next in line. And so Parliament's realizing, oh, we don't just have him. We're going to have a whole dynasty of Catholic monarchs, right? Because, that's, because if the son takes over, and he has children, they'll keep going that way, and she'll never get the throne, right? Um, so historians have argued for a long time about what, why was Parliament going after James? Why did they invite William? Was it politics? Was it that he was this too much of a dictatorial king, or was it religion, that he was this Roman Catholic in a solidly Protestant country? I think it's both. I mean, I think he did ignore Parliament, so I think there are political factors involved. But I think it's mostly religion. And the, the reason I say that is the revolution starts like a month after the baptism of this little baby. I mean, it's like, boom, that seemed to set the, everything going. Um, and historians point out England had been Protestant for 150 years by the time James assumes the throne. Because Henry VIII is the 1530s, now we're in the 1680s. 
England's a solidly Protestant country with maybe only 1% Catholic. So, so he's a real outlier when he takes the throne, right? Um, so James, when his son-in-law comes to invade England, James flees to France. And then he sort of thinks it over and he says, I'm going to fight for the throne. And he decides to fight, it, fight for it in Ireland. He says, well, the Irish Catholics will back me and I'll have a chance to hold on to the throne. So in 1690, James takes on William uh, at a place um, in the northern part of Ireland. And this is a ton of tiny map here. A lot of these slides are like vision tests, so sorry about that. But uh, if you can see Belfast up here, uh, and then this Drogheda, uh, this is the Boyne River. You can see that. This is supposed to be a little inset, but that doesn't help too much. But this Boyne River would be in between Belfast and Dublin, right? Dublin would be further. Right? So it's the northeastern part of Ireland. Um, well, it's a, it's a sort of battle of the nations that takes place, because James has Irish people helping him. William has Dutch forces, right? He's lived in Holland. He's got English forces. There's some Germans. It's a, it's a real United Nations battle. Um, by the end of the day, uh, William is winning. And James takes off. He takes off before the battle's even over and uh, heads back to France. Um, so ever since that victory uh, at the Battle of the Boyne, um, Protestants in Ulster refer to themselves as what? Orange. Orange. Right? So it's this place, right? He's William of Orange, but that gets transferred into a color, right? So you're an orange one if you're from Belfast. And we see a lot of this wall art, even today in Belfast, right? That, uh, you know, uh, praising King William, or sometimes King Billy is called, but you see 1690 at the top there, right? So, um, so he becomes this kind of iconic figure for uh, Ulster Protestantism. Well, back to 1690 for us. In the aftermath of the battle, William and Parliament, working together, decided it's time to punish the Irish for having sided with James. Um, and so the penal laws are imposed on them in the 1690s. Um, among the various penal laws, uh, Irish Catholics were not allowed to vote, hold office, buy land, worship in public, become lawyers, operate schools, become military officers. Now, other than that, they were free to do what they want. <laughs> you know, don't buy land, or you, know, you want to walk, you can walk, you can breathe, breathing is okay. Um, Anyway, this event, the uh, Revolution of 1688, you may know in textbooks is sometimes called uh, the Glorious Revolution. Uh, usually English textbooks, um, not Irish textbooks so much. Uh, <laughs> um, the Irish associate the revolution with the penal laws. Well, James, after losing at the Boyne, right, even before the battle's over, uh, he seeks refuge with his friend, King Louis XIV. And you probably know a lot about Louis XIV, kind of a modest man, a, a unassuming, <laughs> self-effacing. Um, Louis had renovated a hunting lodge for himself outside of Paris, uh, just to kind of get away, you know, cottage, you know, bumped it out a little bit. And uh, uh, you never know when you're going to have 1,200 people visit you. You want to be ready. And, uh, so he has Versailles Palace. We associate him with, right? Well. By associating himself with Louis, who was the <coughs> ultimate absolutist, and if you know Louis's nickname for himself, right, he was the Sun King, right, everything revolved around him. Um, this fed into the criticisms the Parliament had of James in the first place. They said, that's the king we would have had. If we hadn't stepped in and brought William in, we would have had the Sun King in England with James II. So, well, James dies in France in 1701, and in the years following, his son James, now, which said born in 1688, uh, he starts to stress that the throne is his, and he should be the, the king of England. He's the rightful king of England. Um, followers of James were called Jacobites, and so that's a James in his 20s, I guess. Um, and uh, Jacobites, Jacobus is Latin for James, right? So Jacobites are followers of James. Well. In 1715, the Jacobites decide to launch a rising to put this fellow in. So 1715, he'd be 25, 26 years old or so, um, to give him the throne. And so Jacobites launch risings in England and Scotland. And the culmination was going to be James III coming in from France and being crowned as England's rightful king. Um, 
Well, rise and fail. And the new king of England, George I, who was a, from a German region called Hanover, was able to hold on to the throne. I always feel a little sorry for George. You know, he was German, right, and spoke German, didn't speak much English. And I guess the English he spoke, people couldn't really understand because it was so heavily accented. Uh, I don't think he understood that he was a distant cousin and had been brought onto the English throne and who the Jacobites were and what was going on. I don't think he ever quite figured that out. Um, the Hanoverians are still in power. That's the same line. Um, but not all that. <laughs> there was that. House of Windsor, right? The name changes for a variety of reasons over time. But Elizabeth II would, would, could trace herself all the way back to George I. Um, okay, in response to the Revolution of 1688, or Glorious Revolution if you want, and the Jacobite Rising of 1715, Catholics get seen in the American colonies as troublemakers who are more loyal to France than to England. And I think this is sort of interesting to think the colonies are seeing things through the lens of England still. They are English, right, in 1715. This is pre-revolution. They're still very much on the side of England. So in response to these two events, the colonies pass their own penal laws against Catholics. For example, in Maryland, Catholics could no longer vote, practice law, or worship publicly. And there, here's the irony we just said a minute ago. That was a colony actually founded by Catholics in 1634. Lord Baltimore was a Roman Catholic. Uh, things had changed dramatically by 17, you know, 1715 or so. And of course, um, the, the colony uh, is named for James II's mother, uh, who was French. Her name was Henrietta Marie. And it's funny, I can't think of how many times I drove through Maryland. It never occurred to me that that's Maryland. I always just thought I'm in Maryland. I don't know, they didn't, they didn't, but it's named for Mary, right? Uh, so, and that's this Marie, this French Catholic queen. Um, Massachusetts, well, given what we said about Massachusetts, they're going to take some tough measures. Catholic priests were declared disturbers of the public peace and safety, and as of 1700, subject to death if they were to enter the colony. Now, given that Mary Dyer's picture we had, I think they meant it. <laughs> I don't think that was just like, man, hey, we're warning you. I think they meant it. It was never carried out, but I, I think they would have. Um, in 1719, Rhode Island moved to deny Catholics the right to vote or hold office. Um, and I think that's clearly in response to the Jacobite Rebellion, 1715, so this kind of, this news filters back, and so this is what Rhode Island does. Most colonies do something like that against Catholics. Um, and to go back to our earlier point, which may have been a totally moot point, because we don't know that there were any Catholics here anyway, but if there were any here, they wouldn't be allowed to vote or hold office. Well, okay, so that's war number one. So let me move forward to war number two. Catholics become the focus of attention in the colonies again in 1750s. So now we're moving forward I don't know, 40 years or so. When England and France battle each other um, in this massive conflict. What's our next conflict? Seven Year War. Seven Years War, also called the French and Indian War. Um, and in this war, the English were aided by American colonists like George Washington. This is where George Washington gets his first military experience. Um, and they're battling against the French and their Indian allies. So the Catholic French and the Catholic Indians battling the Protestant uh, English and their American colon colonial supporters. As the war's going on, some New England ministers comb through the book of Revelation for insights into the war. Now, I'm not a scripture scholar, but I would think uh, Revelation would be pretty dangerous territory. You know, to jump in and try to clearly explain, you know, those images of the beast with the 666 on its forehead, and the dragons, and the Moor of Babylon, and all, all of St. John's visions. Well, what do I know? Um, a minister in Bristol from the First Congregational Church uh, waded right in, um, and he explained that the French were to be seen as the children of the scarlet whore, that mother of harlots who was rightly the abomination of the earth. Their religion, repugnant to the religion of Jesus Christ, divests them of all humanity. That's clear. <laughs> Sometimes I think the minister, the phrase isn't being clear. Well, he, that's, he's being clear. And, uh, um, as I was reading through this old pamphlet, I noticed that it had been published in Newport by the editor of the Newport Mercury. So the people of Newport would have seen that sermon, even though they might not have been at the first uh, congregational church in Bristol. And it's funny reading it because 
few days after I read the pamphlet, I was driving through Bristol and I drove right by the first congregational church and there's a big sign that says, all are welcome. <laughs> 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 Probably not a good idea. But um, so, uh, so the war ends in 1763, and the French suffer a decisive defeat and lose virtually all their holdings in the New World. Um, and I'll show you a map here, and this will be a vision test for everybody. But, uh, well, this side, okay, right? Look at all the French territory, right? Quebec, all the way to the Midwest, right? This uh, Michigan. Uh, all the way down to New Orleans, right? I mean, just a vast chunk of territory, much bigger than the English territory, right? 1754, France had more territory to claim. Uh, and now, uh, after the war is over, what do you see that's yellow here? <laughs> yes? Does anybody see that? There we go. You got Haiti. Um, and actually, it turns out Haiti was something the French really wanted. Um, sugar colonies, sugar plantations, considered very uh, valuable at that time, they, they took these islands. So they had got Martinique, Guadalupe, and Haiti. And that was about it. So they're 99% out uh, of the New World uh, as a result of this war. The war is very interesting, too. I, I was reading about, about it a fair bit. So it really takes place on three fronts. So we've got this one, North America, then we've got it in Europe, and they call it the Seven Years' War in Europe. But then there was a front in India as well. England and France are fighting for control of chunks of India. And so it's really kind of like a world war in the 18th century. Right? So just this massive conflict. Well, so the French are crushed, and you would think that might allow everybody to forget about them and just and forget about whatever, you know, difficulties people had with Catholics, but no. Um, Anti-French, anti-Catholic sentiments remain at a high level throughout the 1760s. Uh, and they're as strong in Newport as they are anywhere else in the colonies. In 1765, the British Parliament approves a stamp act to raise money to help defray the cost of the French and Indian War. And as we say, a massive war. Right? You just think of the expenses that uh, England would have uh, you know, committed itself to. Uh, and the Americans were really not very taxed and you know, hadn't really paid much. Um, and so I think the British thought that the Americans would go along with that, you know, say, fine. Um, not, not so good, right? The uh, Stamp Act doesn't go very well. And if, if you're familiar with the Stamp Act, you had to have a stamp on all paper goods, newspapers, wills, anything you had for it to be legal, you had to have a stamp that you paid for. Well, the Americans had never been taxed, you know, for this 150 years. They had always been free of taxation. So for them, it's a terrible shock. For the British, it just seemed obvious, right? We just fought this war on three continents. We need some money. Right? Um, well, remember Boston? Boston can be a tough place. Uh, so if you were the stamp collector, that probably wasn't a job you would want. Uh, so this fellow is named Andrew Oliver. Uh, and yeah, not so good. Can you tell what he's wearing? Feathers, right? And I. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is supposed to be like a pitcher of oil, right? So that they poured the oil on it and then gave him the, the feather suit. And then they realize he's a little thirsty, so they're just giving him something nice to drink, like uh, castor oil or something. Like, oh, right? And then uh, in case he wasn't traumatized enough, they go to take him by this tree with the noose on it. So they're a tough crowd. Well, in Newport, Protesters again were, were, you know, responded similarly to the Bostonians. Uh, they made effigies of the three men associated with the Stamp Act uh, in town: Martin Howard, um, and uh, you may not know Martin Howard, but I bet you know this place. Yeah. That's his house, but his name is not on the house. It's the Wanton Lyman Hazard House, not the Howard House. Um, and it, he looks kind of aristocratic, doesn't he? He was very considered very British, and he defended the British taxes and, and the British crown. Um, Augustus Johnston, uh, who was the actual stamp collector, and his house was on Mary Street and Division, I think. If you walk on the hill, you'll see there's a sign that says this was the stamp collector's house. So that still stands. Um, and the third guy was named Thomas Moffat, a Scottish doctor who was friendly with Martin Howard and also sympathetic to the British Crown. Um, well, the New Newporters responded a little differently than the Bostonians. They carried effigies around town with signs on their necks and then set the effigies on fire. Um, 
Dr. Moffat was described as the infamous Jacobite Dr. Murphy. Now, what do you think about that? Do um, you think that's one of those mix-ups? It's like, oh, we already did it. Oh, his name's Moffat. Oh, we already wrote it. <laughs> I guess we'll just leave it on, right? Just a little mix-up. Oh, I thought his name was Murphy. No. Okay, you're not buying that. I, I think that was an effort to kind of throw some anti-Irish sentiment into the mix here, right? Change his name from Moffat to Murphy and then set it on fire. Um, well, the Stamp Act riots had a lot in common with the Guy Fawkes Day celebrations, also called Hope's Day, and that's the first thing I was reading about in that Cagliano book. So each year on November the 5th, large crowds of men and boys who had consumed large amounts of alcohol would carry around effigies of the Pope and the devil on wagons and would eventually throw them into a big bonfire to great cheers. So, everyone having a good time. Um, so, this event took place in Boston and Salem and Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and on Thames Street in Newport, Rhode Island in the 1760s and 1770s. The revelers were commemorating the gunpowder plot of 1605 um, when Guy Fawkes and several other English Catholics decided they would blow up the Protestant King James I when he paid a visit to the House of Lords. So the idea was to blow up the Parliament building, so blow up everyone in Parliament, the King, this was just, yeah, wow. <laughs> uh, nothing came of Guy Fawkes' plot except his arrest and execution. He had actually put ten barrels of gunpowder in the basement of the Parliament building, but he hadn't gotten as far as he needed to, and he didn't set any of them on fire. But um, So here's our uh, Pope's Night celebrations, but you can see uh, this is, here's the Pope, he's got a mitre on, and it's, this is, it's all very hard to make out, but I think there's supposed to be keys here. Right? The Pope has the keys, right? Um, keys to the kingdom. And then we have the devil behind him with the pitchfork and the horns. Right? and really interesting feet, I mean, they had like hooves or something. Uh, this, I don't know if that's supposed to be a tabernacle or not, but there, it's a kind of a, like, uh, some reference to that, I'm not sure. And then, but there's lots of people with masks and bells and horns, and so it's quite, a, quite an elaborate thing. So this is one of the wagons. There'd usually be a couple of wagons with various popes and uh, devils on them. Um, where, where, where's that from? That... This, the uh, broadside? Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, because it's south end, north end. There was the two parts of Boston would have their own rival popes they'd be fighting. Uh, so, uh, and then this is the gunpowder plot. A brief account of the bloody and subtle design laid against the king, his lords, and commons in parliament, and of a happy deliverance by divine power. Um, well, so nothing came of the plot, but except Fox was arrested and executed along with ten other people. Um, one of my students last year was from Manchester, England, uh, which we don't usually have students from England, and somehow we started talking about this in a class. I can't remember what the context was, and he said, oh, we have that every year, Guy Fawkes Day, November 5th. And he was saying that people would paint, paint their faces, there's fireworks, um, costumes, and he said, but the anti-Catholic aspect of it is not really there anymore. It's, and it's almost like their version of Halloween, it's November 5th. I mean, it's, it's, it sounded kind of very similar to Halloween. But, okay, well, so in addition to burning popes, Newporters could read about all the wicked deeds of popes courtesy of the Newport Mercury and its editor, Solomon Southwick. Uh, so here's a silhouette of Solomon Southwick. In the 1770s, Southwick dug up an anti-Catholic tract from the 1720s written by a Spanish priest who left the Catholic priesthood and the church. Southwick repeatedly <coughs> advertised the book, A Master Key to Popery. Don't you like that title there? It's, uh, it's only four shillings. You can get it right there at the Newport Mercury office. Um, and he, the ads come up over and over again in Newport Mercury. Here's one of them. This book will give a more clear, full, and true account of the horrid oppressions and infernal practices of the Romish priests, friars, and inquisitors than anything ever published before in this country. So run to your... Uh, Newport Mercury office. And other, other ads said, every Protestant home must have a copy of this book. <laughs> well, Irish Catholics seemed to get the vibe that Newport was not a welcoming place at this time. In 1773, John O'Kelly, an Irish Catholic immigrant who had settled in Warren, Rhode Island, wrote to Christopher Ch Champlin, a prominent Newport businessman. You think of the Champlin, you know, then and on and on, the Champlin Foundation, really a prominent family. 
O'Kelly wrote about some flaxseed he was going to bring to Newport. And he said, if you are loath to trust, to trust an Irishman, I will not take offense. And I think he meant, I could send somebody else to drop. I think that's what that line means, you know. Uh, and this is one of the things I always find frustrating doing research is you find this really interesting letter and then you just think, what did the other guy say? Right? What's the other half of that? Maybe Champlin wrote back and said, don't worry about it. We don't care. Come and move out. I'll take you out to lunch, right? Or maybe he said, yeah, you better send Joe Smith. Don't you come, right? I, I wonder what the answer is. And Champlin's papers are actually still around, so I may try to track down the other half of that one. Um, Okay, so so far my argument is that Newport's not welcoming towards the French or the Irish, right, with that Dr. Moffat Murphy thing, right, or any other group associated with Catholicism. So now I want to get to our third war involving the French, and that's, of course, the American Revolution. In the first phase of the war, the Americans were struggling to hold their own, um, and so the Continental Congress sent Ben Franklin to France to lobby for aid, hoping that he could pull the French into the war. Um, don't you think, the, wonder what the French would have thought seeing him, right? <laughs> the coonskin cap, I just kind of wonder how he would have fit into the, the court of Louis XVI. Um, well, so he gets there at the end of 1776, nothing's going on in 1777. The beginning of 1778, Franklin could report that the Americans had just won a big upset victory at Saratoga, New York, capturing six British generals and thousands of British troops. The person responsible for this great victory was this young American general named Benedict Arnold. That's another story. Um, well, recognizing now that the Americans are a serious force with a chance of winning, King Louis XVI gets very interested. And of course, he's particularly interested in getting some payback for the French and Indian War, where they got shut out of the New World, and so he wants to help. And so in 1778, the French send a force hoping to dislodge the British from Aquidneck Island, right, from Newport, uh, and that's called the Battle of Rhode Island, and that doesn't succeed. Um, and, but then two years later, a major force, a, a larger force under General Rochambeau, comes to Newport once again. And by this time, England had pulled out of Newport, uh, pulling their forces up to Halifax uh, in Nova Scotia. So Newport's empty, the French come in. Um, Rochambeau brings 6,000 troops for, on 44 ships, and his force includes 12 chaplains. A couple of the priests and some of the officers and enlisted men were actually Irish. And that's an interesting story, which, uh, you know, someone will have to figure that out. But just how French were the French, right? This French force. <laughs> One of the priests was named Charles Whalen. Doesn't sound very French, does it? Uh, and one of the top French generals, along with Rochambeau in Newport, was the Marquis de Chastelux. And we know that's Chastelux Street, right? We got that in the Fifth Ward. Um, well, Shastelux had a couple of top aides. One of his aides was named Isidore Lynch, and another was named Frank Dillon. Those don't sound very French, do they? So here are our generals. So this is Rochambeau, and that's the Marquis de Shastelux. Um, and then there's the case of the Admiral de Ternay, head of the naval forces. One prominent historian for, of Rhode Island in the 19th century said he thought de Ternay was really Tierney. Um, An Irish family whose name has just been tweaked or modified a bit over the years. And I, if it's possible, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I'm sure we could find that out somehow. But, um, but and I, I should point out that the Irish priests, soldiers, they, a lot of people left Ireland after the penal laws because of the complete lack of opportunity. So you have this significant Irish population in both France and Spain uh, in the 18th century. So I maybe to turn it was too many. I don't know. So, um, well, um, um, in any case, the French slash Irish make a good impression on the people of Newport. The Newporters, I think, were just absolutely dreading the prospect of the French coming. Because the English had been in Newport for almost three years, and they finally got, and now oh, all these new ships are coming in. I think the Newport people were uh, aghast about it. But Rochambeau immediately starts repairing buildings that the, that the British had damaged or misused, 
and homes that the British had damaged, and he paid all workers promptly in gold. Right? So he's there, he's got money, he's repairing things, and so that really helps to put things on a good footing. Now, the French aren't involved in any combat in Newport, the English are gone, right? Um, they're just waiting, sitting around waiting for orders about where to go. And while they waited, they rode around the island and went to dances and balls and tea parties with the ladies of Newport. There's a lot of that. Chasselux and Rochambeau hosted leisurely multi-course dinners for Newport dignitaries such as Ezra Stiles, a congregational minister. And do people know him and do you know what else he did as uh, uh, Larry, you know? Yale. Oh yeah, yes, that's right. Yes, he's going to become the president of Yale University. Uh, but what else was he doing in Newport? What's Redwood Library? Redwood Library? He's the librarian of the Redwood? Those are the original books of Redwood, if you ever go in that front room. This is a really interesting painting, I think, of him. Uh, because if you can look at this sort of sunburst in the corner here, and now it's, it's not blown up enough, but in the very middle there are Hebrew letters. And we I checked it with the uh, Turo, uh, and the rabbi said, he, he, it's hard to make it out, but he thinks it's the words, the letters for God in Hebrew. Uh, but that's to signify, so this signifies that he's the librarian. This signifies the friendship he had with the people of Turo Synagogue. Uh, and then this, this is, this is a total vision test. In the pillar, does anybody see some lines? That, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I can't really see them either. They're here. Uh, it's, it's supposed to indicate, they're supposed to be, represent the planets. You know, like the sun and the planets in an arc, and that he had an interest in astronomy and the planets. And so he's the true kind of Renaissance man. Well, anyway, Stiles gets invited to dinners uh, with Rochambeau and Chastelux. He had been a staunch opponent of what he called popery, and it, it's particularly in this little church that he was in. Uh, people probably know this church uh, on Clark Street. And of course now it doesn't have a steeple anymore. But and you probably know this building next door? Artillery Company? Uh, so that's was, was his church. Um, and that's a church that's gone through all kinds of lives. Uh, it eventually becomes a Baptist church and then later uh, St. Joe's. Like a youth center for St. Joe's? Yes. Um, um, which is sort of ironic that because Ezra was not too keen on popery that it became St. Joe's, you know. Um, well, Stiles was thoroughly charmed by his dinners with Chastelux and uh, Rochambeau and the French chaplains. At one of the meals, he noted in his diary that he and Rochambeau communicated in Latin the whole night. So he just thought these were really, you know, thought they were witty and scholarly and just, he, he really liked them. Um, so I think it's fair to say that the Newport people really were charmed by the French. Um, but they were also intrigued by their religion and their religious rituals. When the Admiral de Ternay died in 1780, uh, and you may know if that's where he dies. Where's where? Washington Street. Oh, that's my son. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, there is this elaborate ceremony to bury him. And so, if you know that, if you don't, if you're not familiar, with it, that this is Washington Street and the point. So they're going to take his casket from there all the way up to Trinity Church on Spring Street. Uh, Rochambeau in dress uniform. All the other, you know, generals in jet dress uniform. Uh, and then these twelve priests in their vestments holding candles, chanting the burial service in Latin. Right? And so, um, for if you were a Quaker in Newport, this would be something completely <laughs> exotic and something you never could even imagine. One eyewitness reported that the Newport residents lined the streets to watch and were deeply impressed by this, quote, strange, fascinating, and mournful scene. So I think people were very curious and interested in it. Well, by the summer of 1781, Rochambeau and Washington had finally agreed that they would pursue the British in the South and not in New York City. That's the real issue that's kind of holding them up, you know, and they're in a holding pattern for months because do you go after the British at their main fortress, 35,000 troops in New York City, or do you bypass them and go south? Well, uh, fortunately, they decided to go south. Um, and as they were leaving, one French officer said there was a universal sigh of regret amongst both the townspeople and the French troops at their party. And the officer added that the ladies were particularly sad. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Um, from Newport, the French forces made their way down to Yorktown, where they and the Americans besieged General Cornwallis. 
And then the French fleet uh, besieged them by water in the Chesapeake, right? So they're surrounded by land and sea. In the aftermath of Yorktown, Rhode Island's General Assembly came together and met and declared that, quote, all the rights and privileges of Protestant citizens in this state are hereby granted to Roman Catholics. So the 1719 law is repealed in the wake of Yorktown. Other states passed similar laws as well right in the aftermath of the American Revolution. A lot of these uh, anti-Catholic statutes go by the boards in the early 1780s. Hmm. Well, it seems to me that Rochambeau and his troops helped to shift attitudes towards Catholics in Rhode Island. And then this is what I'm calling the French effect. And I think it would have long-lasting consequences in Newport. Mm -hmm. I want to jump forward just a generation, and we find a handful of Irish Catholics and French Catholics in Newport. So this would be around 1800, between 1800 and 1810. The French were fleeing the revolutions in Haiti. Here they held on to that territory, right? But then there are going to be slave uprisings in the 1790s, and the French will flee to Boston and Newport and other ports. Well. Um, the reason we know a little bit about the population in 1805, the Catholic population, is that the Boston Diocese kept meticulous baptismal records. And so here's some of the names of the baptized in 1805. Malone, Gorman, McDonald, Baxter. Sounds Irish, don't they? So again, we wonder, were these people just in town when the, when the priest was here and was baptizing? I mean, why did they come? Did they stay? We, you know, there's all kinds of questions. The one Irishman we actually know something about in this very early period is Joseph Wiseman, Spanish consul, responsible for, conduct, for collecting customs and giving out passports, if anyone wants to go to Spain at this point. The Wisemans were an Irish family that had gone to Spain in the 1700s to escape the penal laws. And they became a prominent family in Newport. Their daughter became a nun in Boston in the 1820s, one of the first Americans to join a convent. Um, Joseph died suddenly in 1805 at the age of 46. And the Newport Mercury ran a long, appreciative obit on him. And I'm not going to ask anyone to try to read this uh, newspaper, but I'll just read it to you real briefly here. Mr. Wiseman was a native of Ireland, educated in Spain. During a residence of nine years in Newport, a correctness and faithfulness in discharging the duties of his office marked his public, as did his urbanity and pleasing manners, his private character, and gained him general esteem. A widow and three children lament an irreparable loss. So it seems like a real tribute to him, right? A real warmth towards him. Okay, let me just uh, touch one more topic, and that's um, uh, Newport after the War of 1812. Well, one of the lessons that, that America's leaders learned after the War of 1812 was that American cities needed more protection. Who got hit in the War of 1812? Washington. Washington, right? Um, and how about this, right? Rockets red glare, some bombs bursting in air, but our flag is still there. Right, good. Um, well, so after the war, the thought is that there should be a whole network of forts on the East Coast going from Maine down to Florida. The most famous of these forts will be Fort Sumter, uh, built in Charleston, but the, one of the largest will be this one, Fort Adams. And so starting in 1824, hundreds of Irish immigrants come to the fort to do that, literally the heavy lifting, demolishing the old fort. And that's something I wasn't aware of, that there was a prior fort, and that went up in 1799 during the presidency of John Adams, so thus Fort Adams. Um, so removing that, digging, doing all the digging, moving stone and brick and mortar, and there were all these ads in the Newport Mercury, and they're just striking just about the amounts of material, right? It just, you realize the work. If you can see the one um, on the left here, um, 600,000 bricks needed. 6,000 perches of building stone. I looked this up, a perch is like 16 and a half square feet or something. So one, so 6,000 of them. 15,000 bushels of sand. Just this incredible amount. So the Irish are going to be the ones working with all these. Um, so the Irish are hard workers. They got paid about a dollar a day for their labor. Um, and um, But they were also hard drinkers. Many of them were hard drinkers. And the drinking got them into trouble from time to time. Everyone seemed shocked by that. Uh, in 1826, dozens of Irish men battled each other, and 20 to 30 Irish end up in the Newport jail. And I think this may have been a county rivalry. Sometimes the Irish work on these jobs. If you were from Cork, you'd be fighting the people from Waterford. They call it faction fighting. Um, the following year, a group of Irish battled a crowd of Newport residents. During this battle, one Irishman died. He had climbed the roof of his boarding house in an effort to rip off the slates to hurl at the Newport natives, lost his footing, hit his head, and died. Um, 
And there's a number of other incidents like this of kind of bad behavior uh, at the fort. Um, and my theory would be that if this were going on in Boston or some of the other cities in New England, there would have been a major backlash against the Irish, uh, you know, working at the fort in Boston or one of these other places. In Newport, there's no backlash of any kind against the Irish at any time. In fact, when the Irish workers are dismissed in the spring of 1834 because of a funding snag in Washington, the newspapers in Newport express sympathy for the poor Irish workers wandering the streets looking for work. That's what the editorial said. And in the summer of 1834, when nativists torched a convent outside of Boston, that's the convent we're talking about the Wiseman daughter joined, um, one of the Newport papers decided to write a tribute to the Irish at Fort Adams. Oh, here, so we have a couple more Fort Adams shots here. Uh, these are photos that Dan Titus provided me with. We think the 1840s, the reason we think the date is the garrison went in in 1841. The troops go in in 1841. So this, the troops are here. So it's post-1841, but we think pre-Civil War, so the 1840s, maybe 1850. Uh, and we've got one other picture, an aerial shot from the early 20th century, but you can see that pentagon shape there for the, um, for the fort. Um, well, so here's the editorial that the um, newspaper writes in, uh, in the wake of this uh, uh, attack on the Charleston convent, Charleston convent. The Irish have conducted themselves in a manner to do away with any prejudice against that people if it ever existed. The Irish have proved themselves, with few exceptions, respectable in their vocations, and peaceable and respectful in their demeanor. I wonder if they're thinking of that one guy who was on the roof. With the, <laughs> <laughs> the Catholics have recently built a handsome new church in this town, and are a large society well received by this community, and who have the good wishes of all. Now, the handsome new church was here on Barney Street. It was a wooden Gothic church, and it faced Mount Vernon Street. Um, and it was called St. Joseph's. Um, well, so to conclude, I would argue that the Fort Adams Irish were accepted by the people of Newport, and that's the word I want to use, accepted. Because I don't think, I, I don't want to go overboard and say they were welcomed with, you know, you know, incredible warmth or anything like that. No, I think they were accepted. I think they were still a distinct community, you know, but they were understood and respected, but there was still some separation, definitely. Um, I think the positive impressions made by the French Catholics helped erase long-standing suspicions of Catholics in the Newport community and helped open the door for the Irish in the early 19th century. This French effect helps explain why the Irish were treated much better here in the 19th century than were the Irish in Fall River, Providence, Boston, or Worcester. Thanks very much. For anyone that has questions, I'll hand the microphone. It has nothing to do with the period you're talking about, but when I saw the title for tonight's talk, it occurred to me that I have never, ever heard anybody discuss or even comment on how the French people either supported or ignored the Irish during the Troubles. And isn't oh. that kind of odd, because we heard all kinds of support and, you know, everybody went to the Black Rose in Boston and gave money for whoever those guys were. But I never heard anybody talk about French support, and I would have thought the French didn't like the roast bifs much, much better than the Irish, and they were Catholic, and why don't we hear that? That's interesting. So you're saying 1960s, 70s, 80s, the troubles, right, for Northern Ireland? Yeah, I don't, I don't know of them getting uh, involved, and uh, yeah, I don't, I'd have to think about why they might be separated. I mean, whether they were bogged down in their own crises, uh, or if there were issues. And, I mean, I think the 60s and 70s would have been a tough time for the French. You know, like Paris had riots in 68. You know, that 
you know, they had some of the similar kind of experiences that America was having and, uh, with De Gaulle and his leadership in the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, I don't know, I have to mull that over. <laughs> but, I, but I don't, as you say, I don't know of them getting involved in any way. No, no, and I never heard of it either. Yeah. It just doesn't seem right to me. Must have happened, but anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. If I may, not necessarily. Other one. Thank you. Just a couple of points. During the penal times, a lot of the the, the aristocrats, <coughs> the aristocrats from Ireland left. Yeah. And as you know, France was one of the countries they went to, and they did become quite French although they remained somewhat Irish too. Yeah. And, and in those days, France, of course, was the elder daughter of the church and very Catholic. Right. Uh, of course, in many ways, looking back at, at, at what happened, the um, bishops in the hierarchy sided too much with the nobility. And uh, of course, when the revolution came, they were certainly not in favor because it was seemed that the church sided with the rich, which in many ways they did. Right. But going back to, say, I would say sadly in France in the last 80 years, 100 years, France has sadly now become basically a, a non-practicing French country. And as the, as the practice of the faiths diminished in France, and as they had their own political issues, I think although Ireland and France were always friendly, without the connection of faith, it wouldn't have been the same support to Ireland. I would say now at best, France is probably at best 10% practicing. So that has a huge, yeah. huge impact, I would say. Thank you. That's interesting. Yeah, that makes sense too. Thank you. Yeah, in answer to that question about why France wasn't interested, particularly in the troubles, in the 60s and 70s and right up to the 80s, France was dealing with Algeria, yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. De Gaulle was trying to take back Quebec. Yeah. I don't think they had any interest in what the Irish were doing with the troubles. Yeah, yeah that's sort of what I was thinking of too. Is that I think they were caught up with a lot of their own difficulties. and They're kind of lost in great power status too after World War II. You know, I think, uh, yeah, they were, had their own fish to fry, I think. And couldn't look um, beyond that too much. I don't know. I have to think about more about it. Other folks? Kevin. <coughs> Admiral uh, Duterte was buried out of the uh, Anglican Church. Yeah. Was he buried next to Trinity? Yes, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the Trinity churchyard. He is there? Yes. Okay, somebody said he was on the right-hand corner. Yeah, that's right. Looking. The upper, looking at it from the upper? Yes. The upper right-hand yeah, corner? That's it. Yeah. Okay, I'll look again, because I, I couldn't... And it's a, big, it's a big slab now, and, you know, the original um, stone is now inside the church, because that had cracked. So if you go inside the vestibule of Trinity, you'll see the whole original stone and now it's a very kind of dull square slab that was put up in 1880 but it's sizable I and mean, it is in that corner you'll see it but yeah they had to get special permission to consecrate that land so that it would be according to a catholic uh, right but of course no catholic church in 1780 in newport now his death predated saint john's down in the uh, uh yes yes okay. that would be because that's the high anglican church yeah Right. Which would be more so that would be 1870s or something, yeah. And the last question is, they were here, the French soldiers, aside from the officers, were here in force. Uh, soldiers tend to leave things behind. Is there any baptismal records that might reflect that? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Not that I know of, but uh, interesting. We have to do research on that. Um, there was one of the chaplains kept uh, a diary, uh, which is very interesting. I just came across it recently. And he was saying that uh, some of the French officers were pursuing married women. 
And he was sort of nonchalant about that. And he said something like, the Americans have some problem with this. <laughs> and, um, so it's an interesting commentary on that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, look further at that. Right in the back. Yes, Mary. I'm just curious about the name Wiseman. When you said that, the name Wiseman, uh, when you said that name, it just didn't strike me as Irish. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any? Or is yeah, it doesn't the, yeah, it starts me that up. I think they were from Kilkenny. Um, so, so there are wise men in, uh, in our I mean, yeah. wise men. <laughs> wise. I know there are wise men. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the first cardinal in the first cardinal in England was named Wiseman too. Nicholas Wiseman, and uh, they were yeah again of, of Irish descent. But yeah, I wouldn't. That's one of those names I wouldn't. But you know that you had the Bianconi um, carriages in the 1600s uh, running in Ireland as they did in Britain as well. So it brought with them a lot, an awful lot of different people. Yeah. Just saying you had the Bianconi uh, horse and carts, public transport if you will, which in Ireland and England back in the 1600s. So you wouldn't have quite a lot of people moving to Ireland from Europe and different places. And if you actually some Jewish people, yeah. certainly it would have been the Normans and it would have been the Germans. So you would have had some intermingling. Inter there. Yeah. More than yeah. you would kind of expect, yeah. I would say, yes. You were talking about the problems that uh, King George had with the language. Yeah. And um, I remember reading not so long ago that that is the reason that the river Thames is pronounced. Thames instead of Thames because, as any of you know, the Germans cannot say th. <laughs> it's interesting that he he called it Thames because th's are hard for him. Wow, that's funny. <laughs> Just a side note on the Wiseman uh, comments. Oh. that we had a lovely rabbi here at Turo Synagogue in the 70s, a friend of my mother's who's from Ireland. Yes. And that was Rabbi Lewis. Yes. With a burly and everything. Theodore Lewis. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And a mayor of Dublin was Jewish. Yeah. Robert Briscoe. Briscoe. Yeah. So more of a mix than we might think. Right? <laughs> Any other questions? John, thank you so much. I'd like to mention that there are hors d'oeuvres in the back, courtesy of La Forge Casino. So please thank them in any way you can. Uh, and thanks to the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Thank you very much.